Jenna Bednar, Professor of Public Policy and Political Science at the University of Michigan and the EDN Goldenberg Endowed Director for the Michigan and Washington Program. On behalf of Dean Michael Barr, who's watching here today, and the faculty and students of the Ford School, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this special Policy Talks at the Ford School event with Riaz Kanji and Chairman Brian Newland. I'll be talking with Riaz and Chairman Newland about issues of tribal sovereignty and recent legal challenges to that sovereignty, both in Michigan and nationally. Before we dive into the discussion, let me very briefly introduce our guests. Riaz Kanji is a founding member of Kanji and Katzen, a firm that represents Native American tribes in fields spanning treaty rights, sovereignty protection, taxation and regulation, land claims and land use, reservation boundaries, gaming and economic development, and environmental protection. A graduate of Harvard College and the Yale Law School, Riaz served as a law clerk to the late Honorable Betty Fletcher of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Justice David Souter of the United States Supreme Court. He is a principal advisor to the Tribal Supreme Court Project and represents tribes at all levels of the federal court system. Brian Newland is the president of the Bay Mills Indian Community, a federally recognized Indian tribe in Michigan's Eastern Upper Peninsula. Prior to his election in 2017, Chairman Newland served as the chief judge of the Bay Mills Indian Community Tribal Court. From 2009 to 2012, Chairman Newland served as an appointee of President Barack Obama at the Department of the Interior, where he was the senior policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. He also served as the Michigan Native Vote Coordinator for President Obama's 2008 campaign and worked with Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign to help develop its Indian Affairs policy proposals. Chairman Newland is an alumnus of the Michigan State University College of Law's Indigenous Law Program, as well as the James Madison College at Michigan State University. And then finally, just a couple of quick notes about our format. We're gonna have some time at the end of the event today for audience questions. So think about what you might wanna ask now. Um, we've received some in advance, but you can also submit your questions via the live chat on YouTube or you can tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. So welcome Riaz and Chairman Newland, and thank you for being here today. Hey Miigwech, thanks Jenna. Yes, thanks for having us. Yeah, so Chairman Newland, I'd like to invite you to start us out and just give us a sense of the big picture frame. How do tribes fit into the political structure of the United States? Um, well, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, it, you know, people are uh, people who are students of government uh, are are very used to our constitutional republic with a federal government, state governments uh, as the two forms of sovereigns, and then local units of government. Uh, actually, uh, there's a third sovereign in our system, which is uh, tribal governments, and uh, we are. Uh, both referenced in the U.S. Constitution, but also extra constitutional, meaning we exist outside of the constitutional framework in the United States. So uh, the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution references that Congress has the power to regulate trade among the states with foreign nations and also with the Indian tribes. Uh, and then Article, Article 6 of the Constitution references uh, the treaty power of the United States. And the United States has uh, entered into and ratified a number, hundreds of treaties with tribal nations over the years. Uh, and tr uh, treaties are agreements that uh, your students are probably uh, familiar with as uh, negotiated between sovereign governments. And those treaties form the uh, backbone of the relationship between tribes in the United States. But we're, we're referenced in the constitution, but we're outside of the constitution. Uh, firmly recognized as sovereign governments uh, by the United States Supreme Court going back 200 years. Um, and uh, the other part is that, uh, you know, we, we're kind of a, a, you know, sui generis. We're very unique. We, we, we're local governments oftentimes, but we also uh, act with the powers uh, 
that many state governments have, and then uh, exercise diplomatic relations, both uh, here in Michigan with our fellow tribes across the border in Canada, and then with each other. And so uh, we get to do lots of cool stuff in that framework. Rios, did you want to add anything to that? I, that's, that's all very well said. I'll just add that uh, the Supreme Court decisions that Chairman Newland referenced are, are, are very interesting in terms of uh, the rule of thinking about the rule of law in this country. Uh, <clears throat> there was a trilogy of opinions by uh, the great Chief Justice John Marshall uh, back in the 1820s and 1830s, which really established the, uh, the sort of the extra constitutional framework for tribal power. And what, what Chief Justice Marshall said was that tribes are uh, domestic dependent sovereigns, he called them. Uh, and the important point about uh, those decisions were that they established tribes as sovereigns, uh, subject to the plenary power of the federal government, but separate and apart from the states. And that those holdings, which arose in the, uh, the eastern part of the United States, where Georgia and Alabama were trying to crush the, uh, the Cherokees and, and, and the Creeks uh, and, and other tribes in, uh, on the eastern seaboard, have been fundamental to the survival of tribes uh, to this day. Um, because while, you know, in this country, we often honor the rule of law and the breach, and that has certainly been true with respect to uh, tribal powers, tribal treaty rights, uh, the fundamental notion that tribes have this residual sovereignty that immunizes them from state power and state authority has been essential to the ability of tribes uh, to survive because otherwise undoubtedly state governments uh, who have always been very jealous of tribal prerogatives would have uh, acted to, to snuff out those tribal powers. Actually, that's so you've just raised the states um, as we've been thinking a lot about where the tribes fit sort of within the our constitutional framework. It does sort of seem like they're rivals in a sense to the states. And so what are some of the points of comparison and contrast between the tribes and the state and local units of government? Well, uh, Riaz could probably give you the pinpoint citation for, for this quote, but uh, you know the, the Supreme Court in a case from the 1800s recognized the competition between tribes and states and, and said, states are often the deadliest enemies of the tribes where they're found. Um, and, uh, you know, that's often the case actually during this pandemic, we see that uh, playing out in, across the country, uh, the highest profile case in South Dakota, where uh, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe has uh, put up health checkpoints on the highways around the reservation. And the governor, <clears throat> uh, Christy Nome, uh, has been uh, fighting with the tribe to try to get them to take it down. And, and we've seen tribes and states kind of battling for battling over who has jurisdiction to make decisions um, in Indian country. And, uh, but at the, the flip side of that coin is that it can also lead to some very unique cooperative relationships as well between tribes and states and local governments um, to serve everybody's collective interests. Do you, I would love to hear a little bit more about some of those cooperative opportunities. Sure. I mean, I, you know, the, the biggest one uh, that comes to mind here in Michigan is the uh, cooperative uh, management of the Great Lakes fishery. Uh, and, and that occurs, that's actually a, a consent decree uh, that was entered by a federal court uh, coming out of tribal treaty rights litigation, where the, the federal government and, and the tribes here in Michigan, including my tribe, had to sue the state of Michigan to stop interfering with our treaty right to fish. Uh, but what that led to is a joint effort to manage uh, the fishery and the resources in the Great Lakes. And then in 2007, a separate agreement to manage uh, fish and wildlife hunting in the ceded territories. I'll break out my handy Michigan map for you. Uh, my screen is reversed. So, I mean, we're talking the, you know, the, the Northern a third of the lower peninsula and the eastern half of the upper peninsula. Um, and, and that's really been useful. I mean, it's, it's also comes with a lot of friction, but uh, even more recently here uh, with my tribe, uh, using our powers uh, uh, related to public health, we have actually worked with uh, 
the state government and local governments and other tribes to coordinate COVID testing across the Eastern Upper Peninsula, uh, which uh, up until this month actually made it, I think contributed to uh, the, the relative low rates of COVID in this part of the state compared with others. So Riaz, maybe you, if you want to extend any of that, and I'm, I'm particularly curious about when there is disagreement, how it's resolved. Well, there, <laughs> there's plenty of disagreement and plenty of mechanisms of, of resolution. What I, I, I'm just thinking, Jenna, that it might be helpful to take one step back for a second and to talk, uh, I realize that in talking about federal policy, um, it might be helpful to situate us in terms of where we are with respect to the federal government, and, and then to tie that back into the, the state relations. Um, we have gone through you know various eras of federal policy in this country with respect to tribes. Uh, and so when we talk about the states, as Chairman Newland says, you know, having been viewed as the deadliest enemies of, of the tribes, that's often been true. Uh, it's also been true that there have been periods of time when the federal government has been, you know, sort of hell bent on on tribal annihilation, and we've gone through some real uh, vicissitudes in federal policy. But we started off with, you know, the, the Chief Justice Marshall framework of tribes as sovereigns, which led to this era of, of treaty making. Um, as the chairman talked about, hundreds of treaties entered into from the time of really before the founding until 1871. Uh, 1871 Congress, uh, and it was really the House of Representatives being jealous of the Senate's prerogatives in this regard. Uh, put an end to treaty making. The, the, the era of treaty making came to an end. Uh, more, even more damaging though for tribal interests was that in the 1880s uh, began what was known as the allotment era, where um, the United States at that point very hungry for tribal land uh, because large reservations had been set aside, decided to break those reservations up. And it was called the allotment era, lasted for about 50 years, where many uh, treaty promised reservations were subject to uh, being parceled out uh, on an individual basis to uh, to, indiv to tribal members, usually 40-year acres of land. And lo and behold, a lot of land was left over afterwards, which was sold off to, uh, to non-Indian settlers. And that's why we see in lots of parts of the country, you can have reservations with a fair amount of non-Indian land holding on those reservations. And out west, you, you still have large reservation areas with these inholdings. Uh, in states like Michigan, um, by and large, you have very small land bases now for tribes, uh, largely as a result of that, that policy. Uh, in the New Deal era, um, the allotment policy was put to an end, uh, recognition of just how devastating it had been for tribes. And there was a short period, um, a little renaissance of, of tribal rights uh, during the New Deal era. Indian Reorganization Act was passed, an effort to infuse tribal governments with some authority. Didn't last very long, 1950s uh, came along the termination era where the federal government actually set up to explicitly terminate tribes. Uh, the whole goal was to assimilate tribes into the body politic, you know, as America feeling its muscles uh, post-World War II. And then it was Richard Nixon in 1970 who uh, ushered in the, the modern era uh, with his proclamation of Indian self-determination and a recognition that tribes were not going away and that it was important federal policy to infuse tribes with a measure of autonomy again over their, their, own, um, their own fortunes, their own fate. And, and ever since that time, federal policy has been largely oriented towards respecting tribal sovereignty and to building up, helping tribes rebuild their governmental institutions. So that brings us to the modern era where you have uh, tribal governments that have been strengthened immeasurably over the last 50 years, um, you know, partly with federal help, uh, partly as a result of economic revitalization. Uh, gaming has played a significant role in that, but other forms of uh, economic strengthening as well, which leads to today where you have leaders like Chairman Newland and, and many tribe tribal governments across the country who are doing an incredible amount of um, uh, governmental activity, robust activity across a wide, you know, spectrum, everything from health to education to economic development, environmental protection. So when we talk about tribes as sovereigns, it's a real sovereignty at this point. You know, mm -hmm. Governments really acting as governments. And what we've seen with respect to the states is that at first uh, there was outright hostility to 
this revitalization of tribal government. So there was this jealousy, sort of a sense of it's a zero sum game. Either we, the state, get to regulate and tax uh, within uh, Indian lands, or it's the tribes doing that. And then so the more tribal power, the less state power. Um, but within the last, it's really the last 20 years or so, there's been a greater enlightenment on the part of states and a recognition, not all states by any means. Uh, Chairman Newland mentioned South Dakota is sort of a, you know, the archetypal example of a, of a, of a renegade state, but um, a, a, a growing recognition that working together with tribes uh, can really help to enhance overall governmental capability and governmental infrastructure. So like the joint COVID testing, for example, is a perfect example of, tri of tribes and states working working together on, on, on issues. Uh, in terms of your question about resolution of disputes, um, you know, the model, the, the old style model is litigation. And that's you know, a lot of what we do has been litigation that's tribes versus versus states and sort of some of that zero sum. But there is a growing uh, compacting effort, you know, efforts of tribes and states to work out these issues, the fisheries issues that the chairman talked about being a key example. But they span everything from taxation to uh, to gaming, to environmental protection, a, a whole gamut of issues where tribes and states now work closely together. So I, I have two questions, uh, actually many things, so many interesting things, but two questions. Um, so as you were talking about these different periods uh, that characterize these relationships, do you have a, a theory for what caused the change from one period to another? Uh, it, in particular, I, you know, I'm very curious about this flip. Uh, actually, it seems to have flipped multiple times between, on the one hand, you know, trying to disintegrate the tribes and, and then flipping and saying, now what we need is um, increased sovereignty and empowerment. Where did that come from? Um, I, can, I can put it maybe in blunter terms than, than Riaz would. Uh, you know, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it's the land stupid i mean it's really just about land ownership and land and control over lands because uh you know if you think about it uh tribes had uh, prior to the founding prior to colonial powers reaching this continent tribes owned every square inch of this continent and uh there are vast resources here in north america and there are vast resources that are found on what's left of indian country um and and you know wealth uh that has been derived from uh, mining or, or developing Indian lands. And a lot of times that's that's what's driven it. And, you, you know, as we talk about economic development in the story of America, uh, the, the, the core of our legal system is intended to protect your personal liberty and your personal property. Uh, and with Indian country, these seesaws back and forth, if we've got a two century uh, or a century and a half experiment with there's always this this effort. Let's privatize in, land holdings in Indian country and make tribes just have an economy just like us. And that's been that was tried with allotment, and it was tried in the termination era. And there's always you know every few years there's rumblings of let's go back to that, and it failed miserably uh, both times that was tried. And it, and and when I say that uh, it failed Indian people, uh, and Indian people were worse off. And uh, the, the net effect, if you look at allotment or at termination in places like the Menominee tribe of Wisconsin, what happened was Indian lands and valuable Indian lands were made accessible to non-Indians for uh, exploitation or development. So it's a, it's a story about uh, who's got the lands. Yeah, it's, it's such a great question. And, and I think, uh, Chair, Chairman Newland's answer is is a very large part of it. You know, the uh, and I think there's there's a story that sums it up well in my mind, which is uh, you know we just had a case in the Supreme Court about uh, the Indian Territory in in Oklahoma, uh, where uh, tribes were moved from the east to this large uh, you know area of what is now modern day Oklahoma, with the thought that you know we'll we'll let the tribes have millions of acres of land there, they'll rebuild their homes. This is not land we will ever need. Right. It was sort of the thought. And um, and so a lot of tribes end up in Oklahoma and the Osage tribe, the, the chief, the Osage had been moved around the, the West uh, because of settlement pressures. Uh, the Osage came to Oklahoma and the, the, the chief of the Osage intentionally picked out 
the worst possible farmland. He picked out just land that was desolate and said, we're picking this land because now the white man won't bother us anymore. And then lo and behold, uh, a number of decades later, oil was discovered uh, in that land, right? And then in came you know, another crush of, of settlement. So a lot of the impetus for breaking the, the treaty promises and the, the treaty system had to do with economic pressures. But it's also really interesting. I've spent a lot of time reading uh, historical reports from Indian agents and others over time. And there were just so many conflicting impulses, even from people who were well-intentioned. And there was a very large strain of American thought that, you know, you, you, the, the phrase that sort of summed it up was, we're going to, you know, kill the Indian to save the man. Uh, that the only way that Indians were going to survive in this country was through assimilation. And, you know, just sort of strength, sense of American strength and manifest destiny manifested itself that way with respect to, to the tribes. But, you know, I think it's a real story of human endurance and survival and how the tribes did not go away. And they, as as much as, as strong as that assimilationist force was, uh, there was this enduring underlying strength and a commitment to uh, culture and history and one's ancestors that allowed the tribes to suffer through just incredible hardship, but to cling to their identity. Um, and that, you know, strength in, in a lot of ways is what led to the modern era where I think the government, the federal government realized at a certain point, these people aren't going away and we need a more enlightened policy to deal with that. And one last anecdote I'll, 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 I'll tell that um, because, you know, human individual humans have a lot to do with history. Richard Nixon, when he proclaimed that self-determination policy, there's a lot of talk about, you know, how did Rich, Richard Nixon end up being so enlightened about Indians? And uh, the story is he played football at uh, Whittier College in California, and his coach was a Native American, and he was very close to his coach, and he learned a lot about the uh, the history and the law of, of tribes, and it sort of stuck with him. So sometimes little accidents like that can also play a play a big role. And then just a uh, P.S. on on Riaz's story about the Osage. Uh, reservation. There is a, a great book that came out the last few years called uh, Killers of the Flower Moon that that details the history of the Osage Reservation and the oil boom there um, and, and a lot of the machinations around trying to uh, gain title over those lands. And, and there was a spate of murders on the reservation. Uh, and I think uh, uh, at the time the, the pandemic started, uh, Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio were involved in turning that uh, book into a movie. Uh, so uh, for those of you watching in, that's, that's a great book to read. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Yes, I, uh, I, I second the recommendation wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, and so again, just to follow up. So uh, remember, I know nothing. I mean, you know, so should I be thinking about the tribes as being constitutional equals to the states in terms of sovereignty? And if that's the case, how can there have been all of this fluctuation? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm out of practice on the law a little bit uh, since I've been doing this job a few years. So Riaz can talk about how the law developed. Um, yeah, the the question about constitute you know sovereignty, I would say uh, yes and no. I mean, it, tribes are on a we're we're outside the constitutional framework, um, but the relationship between tribes and the federal government is very similar to the federalism structure because states have their agreements with one another uh, to create the federal government, and that was the constitution. Tribes have our agreement uh, about our relationship with the United States through the treaties that we've signed. Um, and so and those treaties uh, vary widely. Um, oftentimes, the earlier the treaty, the, the more advantageous it was to the, the, the tribe that signed on to it. So tribes have, uh, tribes have sovereign powers now that, that, that has been eroded over time by uh, Congress and then the Supreme Court by, uh, you know, essentially might makes right, uh, claiming powers that, um, you know, depending on who you ask, may or may not have existed. And, and Riaz can talk about that actually in the case, uh, you know, he just litigated and won at the Supreme Court uh, about whether might makes right in, in uh, Indian law. 
you know, we're at a really interesting juncture uh, in, in, in the court, in, in the Supreme Court with respect to tribal rights, because I think, um, Jenna, the, you know, the answer to your question is as a matter of sort of original principles, first principles, uh, tribes were meant to be, you know, on the same plane as, as states. And I think that was Chief Justice Marshall's vision that tribes would have territorial sovereignty. They would control um, the, the peoples within their borders, regardless of whether they were citizens of the, the tribe or not, just, you know, just like the state of Michigan might. But really what happened over time, it was more the court than Congress or the executive branch that said over time, no, tribes can't possibly have the same measure of authority over non-Indians, um, even within their reservation boundaries, that a state government would. That's just inconsistent with our sort of sense of, 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 of governmental structure. And so the court in, in basically uh, common law decision-making over time has really eroded tribal power with respect to non-Indians in reservation boundaries. And what we end up with is a really complicated you know, set of uh, rules and principles that govern the measure of tribal authority within reservation boundaries. So tribes, for example, cannot exercise criminal authority over non-Indians within their boundaries by virtue of court decision, except with respect to violence against women issues by virtue of a more recent, you know, by virtue of the, the Violence Against Women Act where Congress said, no, they need to at least have that authority. Court, uh, tribes can tax their own members, uh, can tax non-members only in, you know, sort of limited situations. We developed a really sort of idiosyncratic Byzantine set of, set of laws. What's been really interesting with the Supreme Court lately uh, is, and this is really just the last 10 years or so, and especially accelerated now with the addition of Justice Gorsuch to the, the bench, is that the court has slammed the brakes on, uh, on its own authority to the divest tribes of powers and has been returning more to this original notion that it's Congress that has plenary power with respect to tribes and if tribal power is gonna be restricted, we need to see Congress saying that and saying it very explicitly and otherwise, we, the court, are not going to be in the business of, um, of restricting powers. And the, this Oklahoma case, uh, the very recent one, was the most forceful exposition of that set of principles to date yet. Um, and it was by Justice Gorsuch who said very clearly that, uh, you know, we are going to enforce the rule of the law, not the rule of, of the strong. We're not going to worry about consequences of uh, revesting tribes with, with power and authority. That's for the political branches. And we're going to adhere to this greater understanding of tribal territorial authority over, you know, people within within their borders. And that's the in on, on top so of that. I, that's I, a. Oh, sorry, Jenna. Oh no! I was going to say. I, I, well, I, I was, was going to add that. I was going to add that. Uh, that's an instance where uh, you would think, you know, ideologically that conservatives might not be inclined to be allies of tribes, but. Uh, you know, this notion of uh, originalism uh, and uh, textualism, where you look at the treaties themselves as foundational law, and the law about treaties generally are, is, is pretty cut and dry as, as far as the Constitution goes, uh, has, has made for instances where you can get Justice Gorsuch to author this forceful opinion defending treaties with Indian tribes and tribal rights, and it's signed on to by Justice Sotomayor. Um, and Indian law and Indian policy really scrambles ideological lines as to, you know, and that's that's what makes it fun to, to do this kind of work. One of the things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, all I was gonna ask, uh, which is, you know, you, um, you sort of answered it, is should we be thinking about the treaties as being a quasi constitution? As a, as a, is defining the relationship between the tribes and the federal government, and that it's the courts that fill in the gaps in the treaties, much as they fill in and interpret um, the 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 constitution in uh, relation um, to federal uh, and state relations. So, should should we be thinking about that as an equivalence? Um I would say I'd say that's a rough analogy, and I'll uh, I'll explain why here. Uh, you have to remember that these treaties were negotiated. There was an asymmetry in power between the federal government and the tribes negotiating these things, and they're written in English. 
right? So uh, oftentimes there was a translator um, on on site who was negotiating uh, with a handpicked delegate, handpicked from the United States delegation of Indians to sign a treaty on on behalf of people they may not have even had power to represent, um, and so. It's negotiated in a foreign language, it's written down in a foreign language, and it's carried off to the United States Senate to be ratified. I had the opportunity when I was working in Washington, D.C. to go to the National Archives and look at um, the 1836 Treaty of Washington, which my tribe signed or was a party to and, and really facilitated Michigan's statehood a year later. And so I was in the, in the archives room and they showed me the, the document that was negotiated by the treaty council and then the document that was or ratified by the Senate. And you could see the changes, they pointed them out. So what was agreed to in the, in the negotiations isn't what the United States ratified. And that happened a lot. And I had asked the archivist, I said, so what is the process? Uh, what was the process for transporting these documents? And they said, well, when, when, Back in those times, if the United States negotiated a treaty with France, uh, there was a special box that it was put in and it was bound up and sealed so you could tell if it had been opened and, and uh, there were security measures in place so that you know when it was ratified that that was the document that was negotiated. And they said, well, what'd they do with the Indian treaties? He said, they rolled it up and tied a string around it. Uh, and actually in the case of California, uh, where they negotiated a number of treaties with tribes, they they were never even brought to the Senate to be ratified. They were discovered later in a uh, in a basement, uh, and so you've got all these treaties that that ceded the land that made up California that were never never ratified by the U.S. Senate. So, you know, the, the they sh from a legal standpoint, you know, tribes tribes are really good at we accept that the law is the law. Just quit changing the rules on us, and we can make it work. And, and most tribes will say, we'll live by the treaties. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll honor our obligations if you honor yours. So from that standpoint, yes, we would, tribes would say, think of them as foundational law, but you have to remember um, the context in which they were negotiated. Uh, it wasn't the same context that the constitution was debated by, you know, co-equal uh, states. Okay, thank you for that. I So uh, we've had some amazing questions from the audience, but before we get to those, I have uh, one thing that I um, want to get uh, ask you about, and I guess in particular, Sharon uh, Newland, I'd want to start with you based upon your experience uh, in Washington. So as President-elect Biden is making his cabinet nominations, this is happening right now, uh, his intentions known, We've heard so much discussion about the possibility of him nominating Congresswoman Deb Holland, uh, who's currently representing New Mexico's first district. So if she's nominated and confirmed, she would be the first Native American Secretary of the Interior. Could you talk about what that appointment would mean to the tribal communities? Uh, I think, you know, the symbolism speaks for itself. Uh, not only the first native cabinet secretary, um, but a native woman uh, as a cabinet secretary and not just any cabinet secretary, the department that o oversees the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Indian Education, but other land agencies that uh, directly impact tribes. It would be, it, it would be the, the symbolism itself is important, but it would actually be uh, a, a big shift in the department's operations uh, because Indian Affairs makes up you know, anywhere between uh, one fifth of the Department of the Interior's budget and one seventh, approximately, of its workforce, um, and uh, it, it, like I said, it includes Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Education, and other programs related to tribes. And it's never had a Native American uh, overseeing the entire department. And it was actually only under uh, President Obama that you really saw uh, Natives elevated to the leadership of the department itself as solicitor of the Department of the Interior and, and the deputy secretary. So to have somebody who understands what life is like on the ground in a tribal community where the land is held in trust by the Department of the Interior and Bureau of Reclamation helps deliver your water and your reservation butts up against a na national park. And what does that mean to have somebody uh, 
who intuitively understands how the policy decisions land on the ground, um, I, I, it's hard to overstate the value of that. To, to you know, we always say representation matters, and I think that would be um, just that perspective uh, would be huge. This is fascinating. Fascinating to me. It, it, give us maybe a little bit more detail about uh, you know, take us inside because you've been there. So how and make a prediction? What would you expect to be the change in the extent that tribal communities are involved in shaping federal policy, and and what federal policies might it take? Well, the, what we see differently. Yeah. You know, the Secretary of the Interior, whether whether she's Native American or or whether she's not, is um, you know not going to be the Secretary of Indian Affairs. Uh, that that person's going to have a, a big job and and wide responsibilities. But the biggest part is is again just that awareness. And oftentimes in Indian country, just having people remember us is is important. And I'll give you another example why people are used to, uh, you look at a map and you say, okay, there's the state of Michigan on the map. The state of Michigan's powers are confined to the boundaries I see on that map. Well, a lot of times tribes have governmental powers that extend beyond the reservation, for example, re uh, managing our treaty fishery. And, and other times you know, our reservations are only a small part of what we used to have. So a lot of our sacred sites in ceremonial sites are, are located far from the reservation. And so, uh, you know, Bureau of Land Management, for example, doesn't uh, always think, well, I'm a hundred miles, this, this area where we're gonna do a permit for a mine is a hundred miles from the reservation. We don't have to worry about tribes. Having somebody who knows, hey, just because we're not on the res, we gotta take a look here and make sure we're reaching out and, and thinking about the impact, that's, that's huge. And, and frankly, that would that would um, prevent a lot of conflict, and uh, um, you, you know maybe uh, limit uh, work opportunities for uh, attorneys in private practice. But I think it's going to be important for uh, for tribal relations because you know dealing with those on the front end is way easier than dealing with them on the back end, and just being aware of it is yeah. is half the battle. Yeah. Uh, Riaz, if you had something to add, that we have an audience question that I think builds upon this a little bit. Um, but before I get to that, did, was there anything that you would think about in, in this possible appointment of, of Deb Holland? No, I, I think that all sums it up beautifully. And, you know, when just the the poetic symbolism and you, when you think of the fact that the Department of, you know, the Department of Interior grew out of the Department of War and for many years, you know, remained the Department of War with respect to to, to the tribes, uh, so this would be, a, you know, just a really striking development in, in so many different ways. Yeah. Well, so here's one question uh, from someone who's watching right now, uh, who's interested about this relationship between cultural sovereignty and political sovereignty. So how how can cultural sovereignty, that is protection of traditional intellectual property, repatriation, language, etc., reinforce and further political sovereignty. Hmm. <laughs> Do you want to try that one, Riaz? Well, uh, I'll say a few things, but I think the, the chairman's going to have more to say. Uh, all, uh, given the way our, our courts work, uh, there is a certain uh, instinctive approach to and, and reaction to litigation arguments. And part of that is this sort of some archetypal notions of, you know, here's what tribes are and and and, and here's what's in, embodied in tribal status. And the cultural issues are a sort of a significant part of, of that understanding. And the the more robust the sovereignty that tribes exercise, uh, be it culturally, economically, politically, the more uh, likely the courts are to recognize and vindicate the political sovereignty. Um, and our Oklahoma case, I thought was a really striking example of that, you know, before we um, did that case, I never spent any time in Oklahoma. Um, and when the court uh, granted this case about the, the reservation boundaries, we went down there and I was so struck by the exercise of authority by the, the tribes there uh, across the spectrum, including uh, culturally, uh, 
it became clear that while the state of Oklahoma wanted to make that case about the city of Tulsa, which was within the reservation boundaries, what we wanted to do was make the case about the entire rest of the 19 million acres, which is largely rural Oklahoma, uh, very poor um, and very resource strapped in terms of Oklahoma state resources because Oklahoma is a low tax, low government kind of state. And meanwhile, you had the the, the tribal governments, not only the Creek, but the other uh, the, the other five tribes there exercising a remarkable amount of robust authority. And part of that was, you know, culturally in terms of language revitalization, in terms of protection of uh, sacred sites, burial sites. When you drive around the Creek Reservation, you still have the, the traditional burial grounds there where um, the graves are raised off the ground and, and are open. And it's a very striking sort of uh, sort of image. And being able to tell that story about how the tribes had maintained um, all those cultural uh, protections and, and acts over time was an important part of saying, yes, the reservation is still here. Yes, it still exists. And yes, the tribes should be able to uh, maintain political sovereignty in this in this area. And I, I would just, I think Riaz is, is spot on, on on all of that in terms of, you know, it, they reinforce one another, right? Because the more of your your governmental sovereign powers you you exercise, the the more ability you have to protect um, the your culture and the and those things that are important to you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the the our our American legal system, as I, I mentioned earlier, is really designed to protect individual liberties and individual property, and and it's not very it's it's poorly suited actually to protect a lot of uh, the cultural issues and religious issues that are important to tribes, which is why you see companies that can trademark uh, words uh, from our own indigenous languages. And it's why you can see companies that can trademark Indian likenesses or even words like redskins. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of IP litigation about who, you know, can urban outfitters own, you know, the word Navajo uh, and, and its use on things like t-shirts. So, um, it, and, and our American legal system would say, well, you're the first to put it in the commercial use, so that's your property. Uh, and so it's, we're not, you know, it, it's poorly suited to deal with a lot of these things. If we have a, a, a ceremonial site um, that is located uh, on, you know, a 200 acre farm uh, somewhere else, uh, our legal system would say, you know, the farmer, that's his property. He can uh, sell it. He can uh, make it a tourist site. He can uh, raise it and, and, you know, plant corn there. You have no rights to that. Um, but that's a diminishment of our religious practices. So, um, it, you know, I think the whole purpose of uh, tribal sovereignty, the whole purpose of our existence is to uh, continue to exist as tribal people. And that includes our cultural way of life. So uh, protecting our political and legal sovereignty uh, protects our ability to maintain our way of life and what's important to us. It's very interesting. So I have a, another uh, question from an audience member and it's a two-parter. So I'm just gonna ask the first part of it first and then I'll ask the second part. Um, and it's really a continuation of what you were just talking about except bringing it home to Michigan. So what are the most pressing legal issues for indigenous peoples in Michigan right now? Um, it, you know, it's, it, it's hard, I can't speak on behalf of the other tribes uh, and their people. But I, I would say just generally, um, you know, water related and, and treaty related issues, you know, with the Great Lakes, um, whether it's treaty fishing um, or protecting the quality of the Great Lakes from climate change, or oil pipelines or other degradation. Uh, it, and on top of that, uh, Indian child welfare is always an important issue because we don't have a large uh, land base uh, our tribes in Michigan don't have large land base. So a lot of times um, our kids uh, in our families live off the reservation or even in the in Southeast Michigan. Um, and, you know, if they end up in foster care or uh, in, in the adoption process, um, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, you know, means that we still have a role to play as tribes in into uh, keeping those kids as part of our, 
our people as part of our tribe and, and Michigan's actually, you know, the Michigan tribes are probably as um, sophisticated about uh, Indian child welfare uh, as anyone in the, any tribes in the country. Um, and, and that's one of the places actually where the tribes in the state have had a very good relationship in the last 15 or 20 years. But those, those issues, Great Lakes issues generally in, in Indian child welfare, I would say. I, I want to, I'm going to take you back to Great Lakes in a minute, um, but because we had another audience question about um, child welfare, uh, this might be a good moment to drop that in. And and Riaz, I'm sorry if I, I cut you off, off there, so you, you, um, you might want to pick up on this one. But so the uh, audience member asks, the Indian Child Welfare Act has now been in place for almost 40 years. What has and has not changed in that time related to child welfare? And how should the law be improved in the future? And maybe you could tell me and, and others like me who might not be familiar with it, just what is the Indian Child Welfare Act? This uh, Chairman Newland or, or Riaz, either one. Ch Chairman Newland should. should. <laughs> I, I actually think, uh, um, you know, uh, what it, what has and hasn't changed in that time. I think the Indian Child Welfare Act has changed things for the better. Um, because you saw, if if you read about Indian child welfare and adoptive placement, you had uh, from the 1940s uh, forward until it was enactment, um, just a very consistent uh, across the country effort to uh, Put Indian kids in foster care, foster care, take them from their families, adopt them out. The phrase adopted out is just everybody in Indian country knows what that means because, you know, somebody's kid was adopted by a non-Indian family and, and they're out of the tribe. They're they're in another part of the country. And so that the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, for the most part, has effectively put a stop to that. Here in Michigan, we've actually kind of we've done the belt and suspenders uh, because we have a state law called the Michigan Indian Family Preservation Act. Uh, but generally what ICWA does is it says uh, if you have an Indian child in the state foster care system, um, that child's tribe will have an opportunity to exercise jurisdiction over the case. And if they don't, here's then the standards that state courts will use. And this is subject to a very big lawsuit um, that's going on right now. Um, but, uh, you know, foster care uh, in, in the people who study it, are involved with child welfare uh, refer to the Indian Child Welfare Act as the gold standard uh, for uh, child placement for, for kids in foster care. Uh, but at the end of the day, what it's it what is meant is keeping Indian tribes intact because there was a, a, a backdoor way uh, in an, uh, to break up tribal communities. In many tribal communities, there are, are whole generations of kids missing because they were placed in foster care and then adopted uh, by people outside the tribe. Um, so, uh, you know, how should the law be improved? I think the law should be improved by following it. It's a good law. Mm -hmm. Yes, did you want to add anything to that? No, I'll, I'll chime in when we go back to the, the Great Lakes. But that's okay, the, all right, so here's great my Great Lakes Lake question. My, my students um, uh, in State Gov this semester, we were just talking about the Great Lakes Compact. And uh, and it just occurred to me as, as you were speaking, Chairman Newland, that um, Native Americans are not in any sense a part of the Great Lakes Compact. That is, they're not signatories to it. Why is that? Um, how should we think about that? And and surely, surely, you must, the the tribes must be involved in uh, the design of it and the implementation of it, or not? Uh, why why weren't we involved? I mean, uh, that's a that's a great question. I'd like somebody to answer that too. Uh, I don't know, um, but we should be, uh, and we have. Uh, vested legal interests as well as uh, you know just general interests as sovereign governments um, over the fate of the Great Lakes just like the other states provinces and countries that are part of that yeah and I, I think that will that, that's something that is changing you know pretty dramatically in terms of the recognition uh, of the tribal role on these issues and the fact that tribes should should have a voice. 
Uh, yeah, I think one thing we've really seen change in, in terms of the legal landscape in the last decade or two is this understanding that the tribe's treaty rights um, are sort of a environmental sword in some ways that uh, a, tr a treaty right to take fish, for example, is meaningless unless there are fish to take. Uh, and so tribes have become increasingly assertive in advancing uh, treaty rights arguments uh, to ensure protection of the habitat and, and the environment. And the courts have become increasingly receptive to those arguments, as have other governments. And a very recent example is with respect to the battle over the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline, the, the pipeline that crosses under the Straits of Mackinac, which is you know a huge flashpoint issue here in Michigan. And Governor Whitmer, in her order of a couple of weeks ago now, um, where she issued a, you know a, essentially a shutdown notice uh, for the pipeline, one of the things she invoked in that order was the tribe's treaty fishing rights that, that Chairman Newland mentioned, the, the rights under the 1836 treaty, which would be rendered you know utterly meaningless were the the pipeline to uh, to leak or to rupture into the straits. Uh, and that's, you know, that's that's an example of uh, the type of argument that tribes are advancing ever more vigorously and that the courts and, and, and the state and local governments are are grown to uh, to appreciate. And that sort of principle carries over, you know, uh, to water rights as well, um, to all manner of a sort of environmental habitat protection and, and resource allocation issues. Yeah, I would imagine so. Uh... And, and should we be thinking, um, you were talking about habitat protection, should we be thinking that in general, tribal involvement is going to be in a kind of pro-environment or green direction? Or are there times when um, the tribal interests are going to clash with uh, environmental protection interests? I, I, I think both, uh, Jenna. So there was a, there was a, uh, a, a coal terminal that was proposed out in Puget Sound a few years ago um, to basically uh, bring by rail all this coal that uh, from Montana and Wyoming, put it under these ships and bring them over to China. And the tribes in the Puget Sound area, uh, very similar to here in Michigan, were saying this is going to jeopardize our treaty fishing rights. And you had tribes in Montana <clears throat> in particular who uh, had uh, coal on their reservation and wanted to uh, a buyer at a, a market price, and they were pushing for the construction of this uh, coal terminal. And so you had tribes on both sides of this issues. And there are a number of tribes that are engaged in mining and oil and, and gas development, um, you know, at, who th these interests clash all the time. And I think just generally, tribes are, uh, tribes are happy to do the uh, environmental regulation ourselves. Um, it, it, so the, you may often see tribes that are opposing uh, efforts to uh, place state or federal environmental regulations on the tribes without our consent. And that's not necessarily because we're opposed to environmental regulation. It's because we're the sovereign government. We want to have the authority to do that ourselves. Right. Yeah. And, and, I, and the other uh, message implicit in your response just now is um, that as we have been learning in this post-election period, not to overgeneralize about the political preferences of any particular subgroup of our great American population, we definitely shouldn't uh, make generalizations about tribal interests as well, that it's going to be very tribe specific. Um, and that's important. So here's this second part of that two-parter uh, from an audience member. Um, how can non-Indigenous folks be best allies for the Indigenous people's rights? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I guess the, the term uh, you see in, in a lot of um, activist movements is, you know, pass the mic. And that's really to um, make sure that as tribes, we can uh, be leaders on the issues that we care about. And I think for example, to use the example that Riaz mentioned a little bit ago about Line 5, you know, that's been uh, the work to uh, bring awareness to the Line 5 issues uh, has been the work of a lot of people across this state in the environmental community and in, in uh, civil rights communities, uh, 
small business uh, uh, owners and just people here on the ground in northern Michigan. And uh, one of the things that has just uh, been amazing to me to be a part of is, you know, as tribes, as we got better about asserting our interests in our uh, in, in the pipeline issue, um, there wasn't an effort to co-opt us and say, okay, you know, we're going to exploit the tribe's interests here for our own gain, or we're going to speak for them. It was truly like, hey, tribes, you're at. The, we want you at the table with us because what you have to say is important, and and we made our own case for ourselves, and that, that I think that speaks for itself in the governor's decision. So, so the best way to be an ally is to 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 listen and be humble and not presume that you can speak on behalf of others. I've really seen that, and, and as Chairman Newland says, in the intersection between the environmental movement and, and tribes. And when I first started working in Michigan 20 years ago, it was much more in the way of the environmental groups, either speaking to the tribes uh, or trying to co-opt the tribes for their own purposes and not really engaged in, you know, full-scale listening and, and allowing the tribes to speak with, with their own voice. And there's just been a wonderful change in, in that over the last couple of decades. Yeah, and it, it could be that, for example, moves like, the consideration and possible appointment of someone like Congresswoman Holland um, is just uh, acknowledgement of how important it is to incorporate um, Native American voices in decision making and just make sure everybody's at the table. Uh, and so they, you know, you can speak for yourselves. Right? Yeah. Um, I appreciate that very much. I. Um, I'm looking through these good questions and trying to find something that uh, is brief. Um, this you is should ask Riaz about the Justice Barrett, because okay. I'd like to know what Riaz has to say. <laughs> okay. All right. So here, here I'll just uh, lay this question out. Does the shift from Justice Ginsburg to Justice Barrett suggest that the coalition of justices that had been issuing favorable rulings for tribes over the last few years no longer commands a majority of the court? Well, it's an excellent question. And of course, it's one that's very much on our minds. I am a, uh, I'm a natural born optimist. Uh, so I'm going to be very optimistic about Justice Barrett until, uh, unless and until she gives us reason to think otherwise. You know, our issues um, really do cross uh, across political and ideological lines, as we've been discussing. Uh, that's certainly been true at the court. If Justice Barrett is a textualist in the vein of Justice Gorsuch, you know, if she really honors the language uh, of treaties and, and statutes with re without regard to, you know, these concerns about consequences, uh, we'll be in good shape. Uh, if she's a fair-weathered textualist and, and she's truly more concerned about the interests of, of non-Indians, you know, it'll be a, a rougher ride. And there's just really no way to know as uh, she doesn't have a, uh, sort of written track record um, on, on Indian issues, but um, she does have an avowed commitment to uh, textualism and, and the rule of law. So we'll be hopeful. And the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, Justice Ginsburg, for all that she was you know, a wonderful justice and a hero in, in a lot of areas of the law, uh, was not uh, a wonderful justice with respect to Indian law. Her record was very mixed, um, in part because she wasn't a strong textualist and she did have uh, in, in some ways, a surprising concern for the rights and interests of non-Indians, especially on uh, reservation boundaries. So these issues of tribal power over non-Indians were they were hard issues uh, for her. So you know, the, the, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll have to see, but there is there is cause for for optimism. I think we'll close uh, there. I just want to thank you both for your time today and uh, your insight and for engaging in such uh, an important conversation. And thank you to the audience. Your questions were outstanding, very interesting, um, and, and spurred a lot for us to think about. So I invite you all to please stay tuned to our website site and the social media for more information about upcoming virtual events at the Ford School. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenna. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.